Welcome back. Today we will start with module 2 of this course. So far we have seen the background information about bilingual societies, about individual bilinguals and some of the general understanding on who should be considered a bilingual and how it can be, how bilinguals are not all the same, not all bilinguals are same, how there is a lot of heterogeneity even within that category. So, with that background in place, now let us move on to the uh, cognitive and psycholinguistic exploration on this phenomenon. Now, from psycholinguistic phenomenon and cognitive phenomenon, the primary focus is always on the mind, how the human mind deals with any, any sort of uh, scenario. So, that applies even to language, language as in how you learn language, how one uses language and interprets language and so on. So, from that perspective, this basically understanding language and language development is a window to the human mind's development from childhood. How a child develops over a period of time also has language as one of the important components there and as a result of which studying bilingualism from this perspective also takes us there. So, let us start with where it all starts meaning how languages are acquired, how two languages are acquired bilingual acquisition so to say. So, bilingual acquisition when you talk about bilingual acquisition there are uh, primarily two types there are children and there are adults, children who learn two languages uh, from their early childhood on the other hand you have bilingual adults who learn their second language later in life. So, these are the very broad uh, divisions on the basis of the age of the bilingual uh, age of acquisition of the second language. So, the first category of course is the children, the language acquisition in among children more than one language acquisition among children. A bit of history is uh, important here because uh, bilingualism was not understood to be in a positive vein for a very long time in history. So, the initial studies on bilingualism were motivated by policy research, basically policy in terms of education. So, what are the needs, what are the policy necessities to make sure that children do not drop out of school, that uh, you know all the children in a class are equally uh, capable of following the instructions and so on. These were some of the most important uh, questions that were facing the uh, researchers at a, at a time. So, why uh, was this the case was a lot of immigrant children in the American schools, North American schools were found to be lagging behind their monolingual peers. So, as a result of which it was also found out that this, these children are all bilingual. So, the idea was that these children, immigrant children, typically the Hispanics and other such uh, children were not able to cope with the language of instruction which was standard English. Now, this took them to the second question as to what it is about those children that probably is the problem. Now, in this scenario given this kind of a background bilingualism was considered a disorder because all of these uh, immigrant children were, children were found to be were bilinguals. Typically, they would speak Spanish at home and the language of education in the school was English and this is where the problem was. So, the idea was the clear evidence was that bilingualism is a problem. And this problem, how to deal with this problem? There has to be a ruthless approach to it in, in uh, terms of using the majority language and totally eradicate the invading language. So, this is what they called it the mother tongue, the language of home was considered the invading language because the children were not able to cope with the language of instruction since their Spanish language was interfering in the understanding. So, if you suppress Spanish, children will do better in their English, uh, uh, better in their understanding of English language. So, this was the idea. So, because this in uh, language of invasion or invading language was the language of home and also the language of their own culture, their own heritage, basically their own identity. So, this entire thing had to be suppressed. Now, this uh, gist of this whole uh, exercise was that bilingualism was a problem in general and bilingualism was a problem in particular immigration in general. This, this idea, this view continued for some time. However, there was a, a major change that happened in the 1970s when Anglophone Canadian children were 
made to go through uh, immersion program in the in the in the French language. So in in Canada, as you know, there are anglophone areas and francophone areas. So in the in the uh, anglophone areas, children were made to go through uh, French immersion program, meaning the entire education would be in and only in French. Now these children now have a similar problem like that of the North American immigrant children one language at home, another language in the school environment. However, the interesting part that came out of this uh, exercise was that these children did not have the same kind of problem or what is called bilingual pathology as was found in the earlier cases. In this entire scenario had this um, unusual fallout that bilingualism was cleansed so to say of its pathological um, stigma. So, this marked a very important departure from the earlier standpoint. Simultaneously, however, many other things were also happening. One was that the bilingualism became a mainstream idea. Bilingualism became a mainstream idea. What does it mean? It means that monolingualism as in how children acquire language, how we all acquire language, our first language was a very important question to answer for a very long time in language research and that dominated the language research field. Now, after a few decades of research and understanding and resultant uh, the data that we have, then the field was ready for a shift from monolingualism to bilingualism. So, that was a natural progression from uh, within the field. So, once you know enough on monolingualism, then you can take up bilingualism as a new area to explore. Another interesting factor that also contributed to this focus on bilingualism was that psycholinguistics itself was going through a lot of changes. So from behaviorism, behaviorism was um, the dominant uh, theoretical position in the till 1950s, 60s, uh, which believed that language is a stimulus response system. So all you can understand about uh, language is what is the output, looking at the output. But there was a change that, that uh, came in with the cognitive revolution and Chomsky's contribution to it and also others. Now various mental processes were being looked at rather than the behavioral outputs of humans. As a result of which there was a shift from the product to the process. So the focus was no more on the observable behavior but rather the focus shifted to what is happening behind the scene. That means what is the process, mental process that underlies any kind of behavioral output including language. So that is another very um, important uh, milestone that also has its impact on the on bilingualism research. One important aspect that this cog cognitive turn into uh, understanding human mind was that children's development uh, now was understood in terms of uh, developing schemas. So children develop schemas through their experience in early childhood and uh, which is based on specific experiences. As they grow these schemas get more and more uh, elaborated and also they get restructured. Now in this understanding of the development of the human mind and how it uh, later on turns out to be is that children's experiences determine to a large extent how it will ultimately pan out. So as a result of which bilingualism as an important experience came into focus. So you see so many things came together in order to bring bilingualism to focus in the language research. So fine, all of this in the background, what happened? So what new happened? Many things actually happened. So there are many different approaches within linguistics that try to look at the issue of bilingualism. Uh, before we go on to our focus area of psycholinguistic uh, exploration, let us also take into account the contribution of other fields. So the three fields that we will talk about are applied linguistics, social linguistics and psycholinguistics. These have been the most prominent. Within applied linguistics there have been, um, the, the tradition is actually pretty long and um, they have three major approaches within applied linguistic um, take on language acquisition. These, these three approaches are called contrastive analysis and transfer theory, creative construction hypothesis and the language acquisition device. Language acquisition device as you all know uh, owes its origin to Chomsky. Uh, so, uh, applied linguistics used that uh, his idea, Chomsky's idea to uh, also analyze and understand bilingual language acquisition. Okay, so, uh, we will go through them one by one. First one is in case of contrastive analysis, the idea was to look at 
how the two languages of a bilingual are different right because the focus is on contrastive analysis contrastive as in the contrast between the systems of the two languages so the linguistic comparison between languages basically were taken as an important indicator of the source of difficulty so if my language does not have uh, let's say my l1 has uh, no grammatical gender and my l2 does so with comparing and contrasting these two linguistic systems will automatically tell us that the speaker will find some difficulty in acquiring the grammatical gender in second language. So, that is basically what contrastive analysis is all about. So, the underlying theory was that the learners learn second language by substituting the target language forms into the language they already know. So, second language basically was thought to be learned through a transfer of ideas from the first language. So, that is where the contrastive analysis came in. After some time this idea was replaced by what is called creative construction hypothesis and this happened in around 1970s, mid 70s. This says that one learns a second language by using the same process they used for learning the first language all over again. So, in the contrastive analysis you learn second language by comparing it with the first language in constructive contrast and construction in creative construction the both languages are learned separately using the same process. Third uh, theoretical position was that the idea of LAD language acquisition device as proposed by Chomsky. Uh, this still uh, is one of the most important uh, and, and influential theoretical position on this subject. So, in this theory it is believed that we learn language by setting principles and parameters on the language acquisition device. So, that a device remains the same there is a change in the principles and parameters based on which language you are learning. So, therefore, second language learning involves changing and resetting some of those principles that was the idea. We are not going to detail because that is uh, beyond the scope of this course just to give you a background information as to how different schools of thought have looked at the same thing. Social linguistic on the other hand typically focuses on the contextual factors, the contextual factors responsible for differential outcome in terms of bilingualism. Okay? So, they focus on uh, the ideas uh, of uh, status in the language. So, if it is a high status language versus a low status language depending on this sort of information how it results into different kinds of competence in the learner. Similarly, there is also the idea of additive versus subtractive bilingualism. Additive bilingualism is a scenario where learning the target language does not hamper the existence of the first language. So, first language is intact and you are adding another language to the system. On the other hand, subtractive bilingualism is the process of learning a target language with the intention of replacing, replacing the first language or mother tongue it can be whichever term you want to use. Mother tongue is not anymore used uh, in, the, in this domain we refer to them as uh, L1 and L2 first language and second language. So, when the second language replaces the first language it is subtractive when both um, when you add one after another it is additive. Similarly, there is partial and full control of the language and so on and so forth. So, this is what the focus of sociolinguistic study of bilingualism uh, is. Now, we will move on to our primary area of interest which is psycholinguistic way of looking at the same process. Now, as we have said in the beginning psycholinguistics explores the psychological processes responsible for language use in humans. So, what goes on behind the scene what are the processes mental processes that are part and parcel of language use. Language use uh, will is a very uh, broad term. This will include language learning, language uh, comprehending, producing and so on. So, as a result this, this area of research focuses on why some people learn a second language better than others and uh, when that is the case you need to take into account variables like motivation, aptitude, type of input you know all kinds of uh, forms of instruction and so on and so forth. So, how are various uh, variables non-linguistic variables are in uh, they will interact with the, uh, the learner and then hence the outcome. So, basically the entire process through which the system goes. Now, a very important aspect of this uh, standpoint is that second language learning is understood to be complex a lot more complex than the 
first language acquisition and hence the understanding of the background mechanism becomes even more crucial in this case. How are they complex? What are the complexities? What are the layers of uh, the differences? That is what we will now see. To start at the very at the very root of it, the first and foremost uh, difference that uh, psycholinguistics talks about in childhood bilingualism is the difference between simultaneous and successive bilingualism. The names are easy enough to understand. So, simultaneous bilingualism refers to a situation where the child learns both languages simultaneously. Right? And on the other hand, successive language acquisition is when you learn one language in succession of another, so one after another. Simultaneous is when you learn them together, successive is when you learn one after the other. Now, these two types are different on many variables. It is not a very simple thing like you know one after another, but there are many other uh, shades of differences. Some of them I have added here. So, uh, in simultaneous of course, two languages are learned together in case of successive they are one after another. As a result of which you can uh, predict that onset of the of both the languages will be very early as opposed to successive where the second language enters uh, the, uh, the system a little late. And then almost always the two languages are learned in a natural setting in case of simultaneous bilingualism. So, you are learning both languages at home or with your peer group or something of that sort. So, in the environment both languages are there and that thereby it makes it possible for the child to learn or acquire both of them together. On the other hand when it is successive more often than not the second language is tutored as in it is taught in a like in a school. So, when the toddler goes to school at 3 years of age, they start learning another language which is the medium of instruction in the school. That is how you can learn your second language. So, typical differences are these. So, as you can see already age becomes a very critical factor deciding whether a child is a successive bilingual or a simultaneous bilingual. So, where exactly do you draw the line? When, when do you consider how, what is the age bracket you consider where the second language should appear in order for the child to be called a simultaneous bilingual. So, this has not been very easy and there has been lots of uh, uh, disagreements within the field, but largely the agreement is that around the age 3 should be the cutoff. So, uh, because many researchers have provided support, data in support of this claim uh, from various standpoints. One of them is the learning strategy, then you have neurological point of view. So, learning strategies change across over time in a child. So, by till 3 years of age they use one sort of strategy, but after 3 apparently they use a different sort of strategy. Remember we are looking at within this um, subdomain, we are looking at language learning alongside the child development on many other parameters right. So, that those developmental stages are going side by side as and when the child is also learning the language. So, those developmental stages change after a few years, after every few years. So, as a result of which there are boundaries, there are there are breaks as to how the child changes its strategy. So, that is where this um, difference of learning strategy comes in from. Another is the neurological point of view. Neurological point of view refers to that how languages are represented in the brain. So, as I say the child is growing from uh, 0 to 3 years of age, the brain also develops during that time. So, how things get represented in the brain also changes depending on the age bracket. So, as a result of which because of these two critical factors, many researchers have put forward age 3 as the cutoff. So, by till age 3 many things remain uh, of one type after 3 after three things change as a result of which if a child has learned uh, both of his languages uh, before age 3 he will be considered a simultaneous bilingual. However, if the second language um, makes an appearance after age 3 then the child will be called a successive bilingual. So, this is sort of the idea. However, uh, many researchers including uh, Crochet have agreed that this should not be a very uh, watertight compartment because children like any other humans they are not exactly a replica of one another if there are individual differences. So, those stages might not be a very very strict sort of a compartmentalization and hence we should keep it open. So, due to all of these different kinds of um, ideas floating around different kinds of theories being put forward 
Uh, De Hauer came up with a rather strict definition of simultaneous bilingual because if one wants to look at simultaneous bilingualism in children and the different kinds of parameters within it, one needs to have a clear idea. So, keeping that in mind and trying to uh, clear the confusion surrounding this, he came up with this idea of bilingual first language acquisition. So, uh, in it is called in BFLA in short, he defined it as the development of language in young children who hear two languages spoken to them from birth. So, he is not taking three year, four year or any such boundaries, he just says that the child should be exposed to two languages from birth in order to be considered a simultaneous bilingual. Now, this brings uh, another set of problem. Imagine some children listen to two languages from birth, let us say their parents speak different languages. So, parent um, mother speaks uh, language A and father speaks language B, so child listens to both. Often it has been seen that many children even if they are exposed to two languages, they choose to speak only one they are called passive bilinguals. Now, if you are a passive bilingual, it becomes a little difficult and tricky to study uh, bilingualism in the child. So, in order to clear that again uh, and to uh, have only those children who not only are exposed to both languages, but also use both languages from early childhood, there have been some proposals. Uh, one of the most important proposals in this regard came from Groschon and Lee. Groschon's definition of bilingualism is very simple regular use of two languages. So, combining this with De Hauer's uh, definition, now BFLA is considered to have this new definition, concurrent acquisition of two languages in a child who is exposed to them from birth and uses both the languages from early childhood. So, that is a very clear definition, there is no confusion. So, those children who have been exposed to two languages, at least two languages from the from birth and they have also been using those two languages from early. So, they are the ones who are the clear example of simultaneous bilingual. Now, when one is a simultaneous bilingual, you can easily understand that there is no concept of first language and second language because first and second are understood in term in chronological terms one after the other. So, in this case there is no first language or second language, hence there is no dominant language and less dominant language theoretically speaking. As a result of which some researchers have um, uh, preferred to use language A, capital A and small a or sometimes it also written as alpha not to use to avoid the use of language A and B you know to differentiate them further because you cannot really when both languages are being exposed to and both languages are spoken simultaneously the differences become very less. So, in order to show that lack of difference many researchers prefer to write them as like this a small a or a and alpha. Now, it is a very interesting domain of research, a lot of um, complex findings have been found out, a lot of um, contradictory findings are also there. We will try to see uh, some of them uh, because um, uh, due to brevity of time we cannot go into detail uh, into all of them, but we will see the broad points as to what are the nuances within simultaneous bilingualism. One is that studies have found that simultaneously learning two languages at an early age makes children unable to distinguish between their languages. So, there is a lot of mixing within the simultaneous bilinguals uh, output. So, when children speak, simultaneous bilingual children speak from in their early age, there is a lot of mixing that happens between the two languages. Now, this mixing has uh, you know happens at all the levels phonological, lexical, phrasal, etc. And this is uh, taken as an example of an underlying unitary system. However, it is not as simple as that as we will now see. One of the earliest detailed study of simultaneous bilingualism come from uh, Volterra and Tashner. 1978. This was a longitudinal study tracking uh, two kids, two German Ita Italian simultaneous bilingual girls and they were um, based in, in Rome, Italy and their, their development was tracked and the theory of three stage model came up from there. These three stages of acquisition are somewhat like this. Um, this is uh, in, in stage one you can see that uh, lexicon and syntactic system are uh, only one unitary system. So, there is one lexicon and one syntactic system even though the children are exposed to two different languages 
ultimately what they have um, at that stage is only one lexicon that includes words from both languages, one syntactic system that uh, includes structures from both languages. In stage 2, lexicons get differentiated, they, they, they start to understand that there are the words are different and they are they're coming from two different languages and however they still understand the syntactic system as one and then the stage 3 is when they have differentiated both the languages in, uh, in terms of both lexicon and in terms of syntactic system. So, that is when the child is understood to be a true bilingual and this typically uh, is said to happen by the age uh, of 3 years. Now, this is how the learning process proceeds. So, there are three stages in stage 1, one lexical system which includes uh, words from both languages. So, basically what does it mean that one lexicon, the child does not understand that um, a referent x can be called 1 and 2 by from two different languages. So, one thing may have names that have different names from different languages. So, that understanding has not yet developed. And then of course, stage 2 and stage 3 as we have just seen. So, let us go into a slight more detail based on the paper, based on this 1978 paper. So, stage 1, they have only one lexical system that includes words from both languages. So, all the words that they know, they form one lexical system. Okay? So, a word in one language almost always does not have a corresponding word in another language. To give you an example, uh, let us say a Hindi-English bilingual environment. Um, uh, it has given rise to a simultaneous bilingual. So, the child does not know that the word ghar and house refer to the same referent. Even if he has, uh, he or she has both the words in his or her lexicon, probably she will make some interesting semantic manipulation there because they do not understand that the same thing may have two labels. So, words from two languages frequently almost always also appear together in a three word construction at this stage. And they do not also make much uh, sentences because this is the earliest stage of language acquisition when they do not yet speak in sentences. So, there is one uh, example given in this study where this ch child uses the words la in Italian and da both of them mean there as opposed to here in these languages. And however, she knows both the words but uses them in different contexts. So, she has created, she knows both la and da and uh, she has created her own way of utilizing them. So, this is one conversation from that study that I have quoted here. So, she so shows the, the, the cat, she wants to show her um, mother the cat that she has seen. So, she says, mother says where is the cat and she says that there. So, in, in the beginning there is uh, la when the cat is not visible and when she takes her mother outside and the cat is now visible, she uses da even though in these two words are actually uh, they refer to the same thing. Similarly, the, this girl whose name is Lisa does uh, interesting things with words like da and da ki. We, these are two different words in two different languages uh, and they actually have different uh, contexts of use. However, she makes some interesting permutations and combinations even there. So, this is typical of the first stage of bilingual acquisition in case of simultaneous bilinguals. These are some examples. So, at this stage because there is this interesting manipulations of the uh, lexicon uh, of, of, of a child, many researchers have called it uh, said that this at this stage the children have a language system of the child's own. It is when the knowledge of two languages grows in the child and the child is able to generalize across languages and that is when they start distinguishing between the lexicons of the two languages and that is when the stage 2 starts. At stage 2, they understand that the different words referring to the same object coming from different languages. But what they do is however, that the choice depends on the context of learning. So, child has now corresponding words in both the languages in the sense that the same object can be referred to. However, a very interesting thing here is that words drawn from two lexicons do not occur together in the construction unlike it does in stage 1. Very important interesting uh, aspect of stage 2 is that the even though they have understood the words as uh, have, you know having the same referent, very often they tend to use them in the context of where they have learned. So, even going back to again uh, Lisa, 
she knows that both Occhiali and Brillen refer to glasses. So Occhiali is an Italian and Brillen in German. However, she insists on using it only in that particular context. So uh, when the father says what is this, she says Brillen because he is wearing, the, when she points to the there was an interesting backstory to this. So there is a painting that she that uh, her mother has done a drawing of somebody with uh, glasses. So when she shows that painting to her father and refers to the glasses as brilliant in German because that is what her mother has taught. But when she points to the father's glasses, she refers to father wearing the glasses, she refers to them as Occhiali and then she completely refuses to acknowledge that brilliant and Occhiali are the same thing. So she even though she knows both of them refer to glasses, she in her mind has differentiated them in terms of usage. So when the father is wearing the glasses, it is Occhiali, when it is in a painting, it is brilliant, something like that. So she repeats the same every time she looks at the father's glasses and insists on calling them Occhiali and does not call them brilliant. That is how stage 2 looks. And then gradually the child moves on to stage 3. At this stage, the child speaks two languages differentiated at both lexical and syntactic level. However, here what they do is now they know that there are two languages that they are speaking, but they maintain a one language, one person kind of a system. So in this case, in Lisa's case, she talks to her father in Italian and with her mother in German. So at the end of this stage, the tendency to categorize people in terms of their language uh, gradually goes through various uh, you know, stages of changes and after that, when they realize that in Spain that you know one language one person uh, formula does not always work and they tend to get uh, more and more generalized in the terms of their ideas about language and its use that is when researchers agree that the child has truly become a bilingual. This study is pretty old as you see 1978 and there have been many studies after that who do not always agree with the three stage formula. There have been many contradictions starting uh, pretty early already. Many studies have found that the mixing that this 78 study uh, talks about actually varies. It is not the same across population. Not all children show similar amount of mixing. So roughly the idea is that 20 to 30 percent in stage 1 and then it gradually uh, kind of decreases. However, the explanations for this mixing have been uh, not very uncontroversial. So some of these uh, explanations that have been uh, put forward, one of course was the unitary language system that the child in the initial stages create in his or her mind a unitary language system where all the inputs from both the languages form only one but one understanding. So there is no division. So as a result of which it is understood that the child and the, the brain creates a single system, kind of a fused system in the brain. So that was the initial um, explanation for this kind of mixing. So when both languages inputs are coming into one storage system, there is a there is a fusion sort of thing that is happening as a result lot of mixing and matching between the languages, lots of uh, influence of one language onto another and many such things can happen. Now one, one way of explaining out this uh, mixing has also come from adult speech uh, research. Many many researchers have pointed out that bilingual adults also regularly mix. This is nothing, nothing, nothing um, spectacular about child lang learning two languages. This is something very common. Even in um, the bilingual situation in the adult scenario, people always mix. Some researchers have also pointed out that parents linguistic practice could also have an impact. It may not be how the child sees it, but how the input has been given. Often the bilingual uh, parents who know more than one language probably would also be using a bilingual uh, mixed language in the environment leading to the child picking up the same. Similarly, the context of use. If the child is talking to the father and trying to uh, convince him more, probably the child will tend to use the father's language more. It is It has nothing to do with a lack of understanding, but rather the context of use that has also been uh, pointed out. Another serious uh, issue with this mixing and how it actually works has been from the idea of incomplete reporting that often these uh, studies have very few subjects. So in the 1978, the study was based on two children. Similarly, many other studies have reported uh, one child or two children, very small si sample size. So often what happens that um, others have pointed out that they do not report the entire thing. 
what is uh, probably um, the convenient parts are reported and the uh, messy parts are often omitted. So, we do not really know what the whole picture is and hence we, one cannot conclude the uh, on the true nature of the mixing and why it happens. And then um, there are some researchers who have point out, pointed out that it might simply be a matter of convenience. Some languages have better expressions for a situation compared to others, better as in more salient, more uh, easily accessible words. For example, in case of Hindi English bilinguals, we often st shift to English when we need to talk about some technical things. So, because it is easier that way, it is you know more salient, those words are available more readily. That could also be a reason, it need not be something uh, very uh, striking. So, better options in many cases. Another example that uh, women 1985 have given is that structural factors of a language. So, function words in her study on Estonian English bilingual child, uh, she refers to the structural linguistic factors like function words. In, in this case, she says that English function words were easier than Estonian and hence the child was probably using them more in Estonian context. So, the lot of mixing of English in Estonian and not the other way around. That is and, and the, she pointed out the factor of being uh, salient, salience is an important factor here. And last but not the least even monolingual children they, they use a lot of extensions um, you know the uh, over extension of one word. So, when they have less number of words in their vocabulary they use the same word in many different contexts making various kinds of permutations and combinations. So, that is not something that is uh, only typical of uh, simultaneous bilingual children, but also found among monolinguals. So, these are some of the varied explanations that were provided uh, in the aftermath of this uh, kind of findings. So, that is one. Another interesting angle to this study is that the study on um, based, based on the German Italian bilingual children by Volterra were of one particular type. The parents here used one language, one person strategy, right. So, the father was an Italian, mother was uh, speaking German and they decided they made sure to speak only that language to their child. So, that was one language, one person formula, but that is not the only option. There are many other options as we have seen that bilingual scenario can be varied, there can be layers, there can be various types. So, what about the other types? Many other types of scenarios have also given rise to successful simultaneous bilinguals. So, what are some of those strategies? There are other possibilities are like one language, one environment. So, depending on the environment, language is dependent. It is not dependent on person, but it is dependent on the scenario. So, home scenario versus peer group versus another scenario and so on. A third possibility is one language without community support, one environment. What does it mean? Parents with different native languages speak one of these languages at home and the ambient language which is neither of their native language outside home, right. So, both parents have different languages, native languages, but only one of them is used at home and another language that is used outside is the ambient language or uh, language of the environment. That is another kind of strategy. Here another is two languages without community support, one environment. So, where the child is exposed to two languages from each parent or caregiver and another outside. So, you see various kinds of possibilities exist in the bilingual environment of the child depending on all these factors, the, the participants, the environment, and the, the community support and so on and so forth. And last but not the, not the least, there are those uh, bilingual scenario and the non-native parent scenario. So, bilingual scenario is when the parents themselves are bilingual and they use both languages at home. And non-native parents of course, when one parent addresses the child in a second language despite an otherwise monolingual setting. So, they can use the father or mother can use a uh, second language at home even though the otherwise the setting is monolingual. So, basically this tells us that there can be different types of setting within which a bilingual child can grow up and in all those scenario that they can grow up to be a simultaneous bilingual. So, it is not just one language one person formula. As a result of which we, we see different kinds of mixing strategies, we see different kinds of um, factors within that. So, as a result we now have counter to the three stage formula. 
So, given that there are many types of strategies that lead to successive bilingualism, the three stage formula has now been questioned. Later works, there are many um, studies that we will refer to here. So, later works argue that children are able to differentiate words from the two languages actually pretty early, unlike what Volterra claimed. Volterra claimed that in the initial stage, stage 1, they do not know how to differentiate, but later works show that they actually can. Genesis work of course is very important and um, his, his efforts that reason for mixing is not due to lack of words. They mix not because they do not know, but probably there are some other factors. Cantoni uh, on the other hand showed that children differ in terms of mixing, not all children mix the same way. Some children mix only one language. So, in Estonian uh, she was mixing lot of English into Estonian. Sometimes the mixing happens equally on both sides sometimes them do not mix at all. So, all possibilities exist, it is not one size fits all. Meisel on the other hand showed that fused syntactic systems also may not hold. So, the claim that the, both the lexicon and the syntax are fused also probably are not tenable. Now, this study involved uh, studying syntactically contrastic grammatical systems in German French bilinguals. He showed that from the very beginning children are capable of differentiating between them learning them separately and using them separately. Mulia et al uh, works looked at uh, learning of verbs second property among German Italian bilingual child named Carlotta. Now, she could use this language specific structure from a very early age. German and uh, Italian have different uh, structures with respect to the verb form. German uses a verb second property and this child learned that property perfectly fine from a very early age and differentiated it from the Italian. The same uh, group again studied uh, investigated language specific uh, subject realization in German Italian bilingual child Jan and German has a lexically realized subject whereas in Italian it is possible to have null subject in a majority of cases. 60 to 70 percent of cases in Italian null subject is allowed but ger in German it is not allowed. The children were found to master even this from a very early age they did not mix up. So, in case of German they did not um, uh, use null subject and in case of Italian they did not use the overt realization of subject information. So, basically findings there are many other such uh, findings that show that probably there is no fused system. So, this is uh, this fusion is probably not correct both at the lexical and the syntactic level. Now, this kind of contradictory findings brings us to different kinds of hypothesis, to different development hypothesis, development of the language skill among the bilingual uh, simultaneous bilingual children. One uh, hypothesis is separate development hypothesis, which is um, just proposed by De Hauer. This hypothesis holds that each language develops separately. There is no fused system, there is no unitary system. The systems develop perfectly fine independent of each other, right? There is no mixing up. The, there are many others who have also supported the finding as we have just seen. On the other hand, we, what we have seen till before is the unitary system or this is also called interdependent development system by Paradis and Genesi. It says that the two languages develop in an interdependent way thus leading to mixing. So, the mixing is, un, is uh, analyzed, a, a mixing is attributed to having an interdependent interlocked sort of a system, fused system. There have been a lot of studies that have found support for this as well. Now, how do you understand this? How can both be true? If one is the opposite of another, how can that be true? This uh, brings us to another notion, very important notion within bilingualism, simultaneous bilingualism is the idea of cross-linguistic influence, the kind of mixing that we see, the kind of uh, influence of one language onto another that we see. So, CLI basically refers to the very common phenomena of um, bilingualism within bilingualism uh, that there are one language is affecting the other. So, interdependent system or, or over fused system already has talked about this that because this is they are together and hence there is a lot of give and take possible. So, there is a lot of cross linguistic influence possible mixing is common understood. But then if you, but if you go by the uh, separate development hypothesis, if you go by SDH, SDH uh, cannot allow CLI because uh, they, the languages are kept very separate, they, they learn them separately creating their own separate system. Then why do we still see a lot of mixing? So, that brings us to the second layer of the problem. 
how do we make sense of this contradictory, uh, this kind of contradiction, the mixing and the CLI. There have been many uh, ideas put forward, but largely they can be understood uh, through three different kinds of um, explanations, the different kinds of theoretical positions. One is uh, the language dominance theory. Now, Eep and Matthew's uh, studies, the, they have, they, they looked at Cantonese uh, English bilinguals and they put forward the idea that the language which is dominant, even when you are in the child is growing up in a bilingual setup, chances are only in an ideal situation both languages will have 50 percent uh, of input, but that does not always happen. So, one language becomes uh, dominant language, the other becomes less dominant language. So, as in this kind of a scenario, probably the dominant language will have more influence on the less dominant language. So, that is the explanation given by Matthews and Yip. Another is that sometimes the same data has been, a data set has been um, interpreted differently by different uh, researchers. For example, this uh, study by Mishina Mori in 2005, they found proof of both separate development hypothesis as well as CLI uh, between Japanese and English uh, bilingual children. But the same data was interpreted um, by D. Howard as supporting only separate development hypothesis. There are even finer nuances, we are not getting into that, but this is basically what the finding is. And then there have also been proposals that perhaps there are some domains within the language system that are more prone to CLI than others. And this seems to be a very plausible explanation. We will see now why. Because of this contradictory systems of languages showing separate development at the same time also showing a lot of mixing and all of these data none of them can be uh, really uh, ignored all of them are uh, you know, results of uh, uh, careful studies. So, both of them exist separate system exist mixing also exist. Now, this has given rise to uh, some researchers proposing that probably language should not be seen as a single system. So, German is not just as a language German, but it has many layers within the language system. So, there are uh, even within syntax, there are layers within lexicon, within morphology, there are many layers. So, what if we look at language not as a single system, but as a system having many subsystems. Now, within those subsystems, some are probably capable of developing on their own independently, separately and some subsystems probably are more prone to or they have called it vulnerable, vulnerable to influences. If you take that standpoint, then many of the findings can be uh, seen through that, 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 that prism, then it becomes easy to understand. So, languages can develop separately and still influence one another if we take this subsystem view. So, in fact, simultaneous bilingualism does allow as per Muller separation of some of the grammatical aspects while keeping some domains open for uh, influence. So, a very influential paper, influential study in 2000 uh, by Hulk and Muller, they have a very important proposal. This their little study proposes that linguistic properties and grammatical aspect structures can predict CLI. So, basically how, what are the properties between the two, what are the grammatical properties between the two languages of the bilingual that decides whether you will find, a, uh, find CLI or not find CLI. Dominance factor is, is ruled out by this uh, particular study. They say that language dominance or preference probably are not what is uh, creating the problem, the creating the, uh, the, the influence that we see, the mixing that we see what basically it is the structure. So, there they propose a particular grammatical structure that makes it possible for that that makes it open for CLI. So, this is how they put it the vulnerable grammatical phenomenon is an interface property. For example, interface between syntax and pragmatics. So, what do we mean by interface syntax and property and uh, pragmatics for different pragmatic functions the syntactic structure of a language probably can be manipulated. So, when syntactic structure has a pragmatic function, this is called uh, one of the interface types. So, if that is the case, this is one example, if this kind of a scenario exists and the surface string of the two languages are similar uh, for the expression of this vulnerable grammatical property. So, the language A has uh, only one option for expressing that, whereas language B has more than one expression. In such a case, this is possible 
that you will find some amount of CLI. So, they gave one example which is the idea of dislocated sentences which are syntactic structures that serve the pragmatic function of foregrounding or backgrounding of sentence parts. So, he the, 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 idea, the use of pronoun sometimes uses as a foregrounded object in French sentences has the function of focusing on that subject. This is a very common aspect of French language. So, if French English bilingual children use more of dislocation in their English than monolingual English speaking children. So, when my French English bilingual speakers have this idea, this interface, grammatical interface of using different kinds of syntactic structure for the purpose of foregrounding the information, French has uh, this option, French has this as a very prominent uh, grammatical uh, property. English has both the possibilities, it can or it may not. So, in case of French, biling French English bilingual, it has been seen that even in the English output, children tend to use the French construction, sometimes even leading to ungrammaticality. However, English monolingual children never do that. So, this is an example of the CLI when the children have you know, this kind of an option, right. So, the interface is between syntax and pragmatics in this case where a syntactic function has a pragmatic syntactic structure, uh, sorry there is a typo here, uh, syntactic uh, structure has a pragmatic function and between French and English there are overlap between the languages and hence we see the uh, cross linguistic influence in this case. So, these are certain conditions, grammatical conditions that must hold in order for uh, cross linguistic influence to be seen as per this theory. This is of course, a theoretical a very important theoretical uh, assumption that uh, there are whether there are separate language development or there are unitary language development and even if there are separate language development theory is adopted, how you can still understand the cross linguistic influence, what are the conditions within which cross linguistic influence will be visible. Now, this is of course, one of the major uh, aspects of simultaneous bilinguals. Some other important theoretical position, the theoretical uh, points are the very problem of bilingual acquisition, okay, how complex the bilingual acquisition is and simultaneous bilingual acquisition in children uh, is and how it can be studied. So, that complexity, that issue of complexity is of course, of uh, great importance theoretically. Uh, similarly, the balanced and unbalanced development and the idea of input, all of all these three are interconnected and we will see how. First, the problem of bilingual acquisition and the main question that language acquisition studies typically ask be it monolingual or bilingual is how does the child develop his grammar, what goes on into the in the human mind when you are developing the idea. Now, this problem gets a little more complicated in bilingual children compared to monolingual children. So, how does the child develop the grammar of two languages given the spare very less input? We all know about the poverty of stimulus um, uh, theory put forward by Chomsky that the children when they are growing up, they do not really listen to millions of sentences that they will eventually go on to create. So, there, the, there is a clear mismatch between the input and the output. How is it possible that the child masters the language, his first language in spite of such less input? And now, if we come to bilingualism, simultaneous bilingual children, the problem gets doubled, right? So, you, if uh, in any monolingual scenario uh, is whatever input is the, the child is getting, it is 100 percent of the same language. In a bilingual scenario, that, that, that gets divided into two. So, the input in each language gets even less. So, that basically doubles our problem that that makes it a more complex problem. So, this problem has been talked about from generative and uh, irrespective of the theoretical position. So, both generative uh, linguists and emergentists and others have all talked about this and have tried to look at this question more thoroughly. So, in BFLA for example, they say that facts are at least twice as complex as opposed to the uh, monolingual scenario in terms of how the complexity is really tackled. So, this can be understood in terms of both quantity and quality. So, in quantity in an idealized case as I was mentioning a little while ago, 
that uh, where we can assume that balanced input will be given. So, 50 percent from language 1, 50 percent from language 2. However, that does not always work that way. You know, it can be from anywhere depending on the kind of input. One, one does not really uh, uh, think and give that, that sort of a balanced input. So, in more realistic cases, basically the children will not get equal amount of input from both the languages. Now, this probably will give rise to a weaker language later. So, depending on which language gets higher amount of input even within that bilingual setup, it will probably a deciding factor into creating his dominant and less dominant language that is one. In terms of quality, even in case of monolingual child, a given sample input is compatible with a numerous underlying grammar. So, one particular segment can be can take you to various possibilities in terms of grammar. Now, in terms of bilingual children, the problem just gets doubled. So, in this case, um, poverty of stimulus as a result has been reframed as poverty of the dual stimulus. Not only there is a lack of uh, adequate uh, stimulus here in, in terms of the input language, in case of bilinguals, it becomes double the problem. That is uh, one important issue that is facing researchers today you know, while studying simultaneous bilingual children. Now, a connected idea is that of balanced and unbalanced development. As we said that depending on the input imbalance, the output will also be either balanced or unbalanced. So, depending on how much what is the weightage given to each of the languages of the bilingual child, you will have a balanced bilingual or an unbalanced bilingual even when. So, in an entire entirely ideal situation, a simultaneous bilingual child will grow up into a balanced, balanced bilingual child but that does not always happen. So, why does not it happen is what we are trying to understand. So, balanced and unbalanced development can be understood from this kind of a background. So, the language faculty is often thought to be fully capable of handling the challenges of input. Going back to Chomsky, Chomsky's idea was that even though there is a poverty of stimulus in a monolingual scenario, children actually grow up into perfect uh, perfectly good speakers of native language. They have good, am good amount of, they have uh, high competence in all the possible aspects of grammar of that language. So, input probably does not really have a very strong impact in first language uh, development. However, in bilingual case, the question is however, it, it, does it hold for bilingual case? Does it give rise to balanced versus unbalanced bilinguals or does it ignore does the system underlying system is a system capable of ignoring all of that and still create balanced bilinguals. So, these are the nuances the, 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 these are the two possibilities. On the one hand we agree that the human brain is capable enough to override that problem. However, in case of bilingualism that is not always the case. So, what is exactly happening is what is a matter of great interest among researchers today. And then of course, we have the input effects. So, all of these are connected. It has been argued that in case of bilingual acquisition, input plays a larger role than that of monolingual children that you can already expect because of the discussion till now. Because in case of monolingual children, irrespective of the poverty of stimulus, every child goes grows up to become a uh, perfect speaker of his native language. That is not always the case with bilinguals. So, hence input has a bigger role here as opposed to the monolingual children. Hence, it is necessary to estimate. So, a lot of work is now going on in uh, trying to understand the different types of uh, stimulus that has been given as an input in the uh, for the children. Uh, one interesting study, uh, recent study talked looked at the Singapore English bilingual children. So, where they find a lot of Chinese influence in the English that the uh, uh, children speak. Now, the question is, is it the nature of Singaporean English or is it the way the language was, the input was given to the child. So, input is the, uh, so what is it the result of? That is a very uh, important question that they are trying to find out. So, input is not only in terms of quantity, but also in terms of quality. So, those things are uh, to be understood. So, what are, the, are they balanced, unbalanced and what, what was the way in which the input was given? These are some of the important notions within simultaneous bilingualism uh, of children that has been probed. So, this is where we stop with simultaneous bilingualism of children. In the next part, we will look at successive bilingualism and we will see there are some similarities across these categories and there are some interesting differences as well. 
So, part 2 will uh, deal with successive bilingualism among children as well as adult second language acquisition. Thank you. Thank you.